Hey everyone, Raylan here. I have such an exciting video interview for you today. I had so many requests from all of you watching to get Mary Reddick on the channel and I reached out to her and oh my goodness, she said yes. So I'm thrilled to have her here today. So thank you to all of you for this amazing suggestion. For those of you who aren't aware, Mary Reddick is an internationally acclaimed nutritionist currently based we're kind of all over the place. I might get her to explain that. Um, but she's um, doing some fascinating research on pre-colonial diets and their protective mechanisms towards health. And she has a bunch of different you know, health and wellness programs, just a lot of really great stuff. So it's really an honor to have you here today, Mary. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me. So where are you based? Let's start there. That sure. doesn't seem like it's a simple answer. <laughs> sure. So at the moment, <laughs> as we speak, I'm in Colombia, Medellin, and I'm based out of both Athens, Greece and Cape Town, South Africa. That's where my homes are. My residency is in Greece. I'm working on a business residency in South Africa, but I'm rarely at either homes. I'm usually in another country and each week or each month, I'm typically in a new destination. <laughs> Yeah, you're off to a new country in just, just a few days, you were saying. That's right. I'm headed off to Costa Rica on Tuesday. So exciting. I just love it. I have so much respect for the work that you do and the adventurous way that you live your life. I think it's just incredible. So I'm so excited to dive into, I'll find out more about, uh, about everything that you're doing. So but before we dive into that, I'm always curious to know, what got you onto this path of, you know, with your focus on nutrition and supporting people's health and wealth? Sorry, I'm going to do that mm -hmm. one again. <laughs> So before we dive into all that, I'm really curious to know what got you uh, so interested in nutrition and supporting people on their health and wellness journeys and your passion for that. Where did that come from? Ah, it's from survival. I went through a horrific illness for 12 years where I was really quite disabled. And uh, despite Western medicine's best efforts, it, it wasn't helpful. I ended up healing by buying different groceries. And <clears throat> had my old self heard that, I would have written it off because I thought I ate so healthfully before I was sick and when I became sick. But it was really in studying archaeology and ancestral diets to where I actually ended up getting myself into remission. So I've made it a goal since getting there to help as many people as I can also get into remission from quote unquote impossible to reverse conditions. And part of that is in education, showing people what real health looks like. And you really only see that in very small secluded areas of the world that haven't been impacted by modern diets and lifestyles. It's amazing how many of us come to this passion from our own experience. I think coming through it, it's such a growth boot camp and you have to become an expert in health and, you know, overall thriving in life. So I think it's just a really great place to come from, especially when working with other people, because you're coming from a place of experience. So that empathy and that understanding is just there. And I imagine the people that you work with appreciate that aspect of your experience a lot. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know how people work in the field without having gone through something significant and coming out on the other side. And I think one of the blessings of what we're seeing of so much illness uh, in that and that so many people are ill today is that it's providing more opportunities for people to go through their own hero's journey, put themselves into remission and then pass that knowledge on to other people. Because without having gone through it, it's very different. I, I would find it difficult to recommend the kind of extreme things that I do. And especially with such confidence uh, and be able to be that light at the end of the tunnel for these folks, you know, once you've been through it yourself. And then also once you've seen so many thousands of people uh, get better you get a lot of confidence. So you really can be that light in the end of the tunnel for someone when, when they have no light of their own. And, and that's a very powerful thing. It's something to counteract the, the almost wizard like curse. If you think of it in mythological terms of a diagnosis. I love from what you've said and from everything I've seen of your work, there's a strong message of empowerment for people who are facing these sorts of conditions. And I've taken a quote um, from somewhere from you, and I've shared it on my social media spaces because I just love it and it really resonates. And you said, you know, as much as there's people there to help you, you know, what I've taken from you is, you know, one is fixing this for you. You've got to engineer your own healing and you have to keep in mind that any practitioner you work with is your employee. You don't have to take their advice. And that is so counterintuitive to everything I think a lot of us are socialized to believe. Yes. You know, I used to think my doctor was my boss. 
whatever he said to do, I did it. I was just a passive participant in all of it. Yeah, it was, you know, year seven of, of the 12 year uh, condition. I, I realized I had to stop looking outward. I realized I had to stop waiting for someone to invent a cure. I had been to the best of the best doctors. I had been to all the famous people. I was, I was worse. I was so much worse. And so I finally realized, listen, either it's I die now, which would be a relief, to be honest, <laughs> at, that, at that stage, or I dig myself out. I can't be looking to anyone else to do this anymore. That's not working. And it was when I shifted that mindset, that's when things really changed. So something I do with my clients is I really try to get them fully responsible, fully responsible for themselves. And what that means is I'm not on call, right? We'll do a check-in once a week at most, but for the rest of the time, they have got to figure this stuff out on their own, right? Because otherwise you don't gain that confidence. You don't get that power back that you lose when you become ill. You become so disempowered when you're ill. And yet, even if you're bed bound, you can become internally very empowered based on your approach and based on your your mental approach of the condition. I love that. And we could do an entire interview just on, we could probably do a series of interviews just on your health journey. I, I know we have a lot more to cover beyond that. Majority of my viewers are people facing conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome, NECFS, long COVID, and so forth. Um, And I I think in many ways, healing is healing, but I'm sure viewers will be curious to know a little bit if they're not already aware. um, Was there a diagnosis that you had or what health conditions that you're working to come back from? Yeah, so I had post-viral dysautonomia, very similar to long COVID. It's basically the same thing. I was extremely healthy, at least I felt. (laughs) And I got a bug that went into my brain when I was 18. And it made me very disabled with a a quite severe form of dysautonomia. What that means for those who aren't familiar, that's a deregulation of the autonomic nervous system. It's now considered an autoimmune condition of both the adrenal receptors and of the nervous system. We didn't know that at the time. Uh, And honestly, it took seven years to diagnose. But... uh, But with that, the longer you have it, at least for me, I don't want (laughs) to tell your listeners it's going to happen to them if they have this condition. But for me, it turned into two autoimmune thyroid conditions, kidney disease, quite severe liver disease. I was on a breathing machine, uh, severe neuropathy from the waist down. So, So it had many, many more things along with it. And honestly, the diagnoses could go on, but those are the major ones and the ones that can be life threatening that went along with it. So, so it's really been my passion since COVID hit, uh, you know, before, even four years ago, no one knew what dysautonomia was, even in the medical community, it was rare to find a doctor who was familiar with this if they weren't a neuromuscular specialist, but now it's becoming a household name. It was even on Jeopardy earlier this year and POTS is becoming well-known postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is what long callers are getting. And so I started working with because I've specialized in dysautonomia and nervous system conditions like CFS for the last 10 years, when long COVID hit, I started to get a lot of clients for that. And I realized that what I knew could not be, I couldn't get enough knowledge spread one-to-one the way I work. So I just spoke at a conference a couple months ago, a medical conference, sharing everything I knew that gets people with conditions like long COVID and dysautonomia into remission because there's a there's a real pathway you can follow and it is possible to get out. We know that because there are tens of thousands of us on the other side. But if you look online or if you go into so many groups, it's going to say, no, this is impossible. But uh, once you've got it, you've got it. And that's just not the case. So it's become my new mission. I really feel that I was very much put on this earth at the right time because when I was going through that illness, you know, a decade and a half ago and two decades ago, it seemed like there was no purpose to it. And now I'm standing here with 70 million people with dysautonomia and so many of those from long haul and long COVID. And I I have the knowledge that can get so many people out. So I'm very excited to try to get this knowledge shared. So I'm speaking at as many conferences as I can. I'm putting together a workshop so I can put that on YouTube so people can help themselves. And uh, really just any way to disseminate this information so that people can get better today instead of floundering. This is just so moving and so inspiring. And the whole time you were talking, I was just getting waves of goosebumps over my body. I can't believe 
what you've been through, but moreover, just that you've come through it and that this used to be so hopeless for so many people. And so many people used to be left completely on their own, feeling like there was no way out and what a desperate place to be to far too many of us know that place far too well. So it's just, I'm just so grateful that there are people like yourself who have figured out how to get past it and now have taken that experience and that passion and, you know, helping other people because it's, it's, it's such a nightmare to be trapped in these conditions and it's we need to help each other out. any healthy person will ever know. It's not even something yeah. you can communicate. And I think that's the hard part about these conditions from chronic fatigue syndrome on down is that you can't communicate it to someone who hasn't had it because there's no real words for it. And it's not logical. It's not logical to feel different five minutes uh, from now than you did before, have a totally different body temperature or uh, have a very different feeling. So it's quite isolating. I, I think it's going, we're going to get more community thanks to COVID of all things, because it's making these conditions famous. Uh, uh, but hopefully that means more information will be spread as well that can actually help. Yeah, it's unfortunate that we needed such a horrific, horrific situation to happen. But like with all of these things, there's often a silver lining. And that is it for this. But we've got a massive spotlight now and a lot of people who needed it. And a lot more research is being generated and just a lot more information is available. So for those of you watching, if you're facing something like this, there is more reason now than ever to be hopeful. There are just so many options out there, so much support. So yeah. Uh, anyways, I could go on all day, but I really want to get into, um, you know, some of your, your research and um, your experience of health and healing. I know that you work with many people facing health conditions. If and how nutrition is a part of healing with conditions like NDCFS and long Oh, in my, in my experience, no question. <laughs> and there's actually multiple diets that work depending on what is called the CFS, the ME, and the close viral syndrome, we'll call it. Uh, but about 90% respond to one protocol and 8% respond, respond to another and 2% respond to another. So I know, I know how to suss those out. I would say the lifestyle things are equally important to the diets that are used for these, for these conditions, simply because the microbiome, which makes up anywhere from 60 to 90% of us is so deeply involved and, and on a, a very significant level. Is it involved? You know, so often people with CFS will have normal looking blood work. In fact, their blood work will be so good. They'll go to the doctor and they'll be like, you look great. Go home. You're fine. And the person can't drive. <laughs> so, so, but that's often because the issue is in the nervous system and in the microbiome, which is not being tested for those folks. So the way that you uh, rebalance the nervous system, the limbic system, the immune system and the microbiome is very different than you would work with other conditions. And so for that, you need to do a lot of lifestyle and dietary modifications. And they're not moderate, I would say. Like you can't do something one day and not the next. You basically have to fully retrain your body, just like you were raising an infant. If you've, if you've had kids, you've seen or been around them, you see when they miss a nap, right? Or someone doesn't give them a meal at the right time. How upsetting things can be. That's basically a body with CFS or long COVID at all times. And so you want to have a very regular schedule where you don't miss a single thing. And that can go a long way towards retraining the nervous system and the microbiome. I think that's such a great example because it can be hard to, I think many of us live our lives getting away with uh, not a lot of consistency, yes. not a lot of self-care, and it becomes normalized. Yeah. And also, you know, I think it's Mel Robbins, um, author, I love her. She said, you know, you have to parent yourself as an adult because once you're an adult, no one else is going to. Like, you have to make sure you get your sleep, you eat your broccoli or whatever it is. And I think we somehow lose sight of that a lot. We get caught up in busy life and we think that we can let all that go by the wayside. We really do. We really do. And if we get hit with something like CFS or ME, then our energy is suppressed. And so we tend to focus... Uh, our energy on helping our loved ones and then really bottoming out for ourselves. And it, it's quite the opposite. It's what Mel said. You actually have to parent yourself and, and think about if you were healthy, all the things that you could do for your family. So it's actually, it's not a selfish act to get yourself healthy. It's the opposite. So you said that there are a few different diets mm -hmm. that work for people. And I love this because mm -hmm. I think uh, most of us are coming to appreciate that there doesn't seem to be a one size fits all plan for everyone. 
um, we have to tailor it a bit, but what are, can you give us a sense of what some of those different dietary approaches are? Yeah. So <laughs> with some people, especially the folks I was working with before long COVID hit, a lot of people with dysautonomia and CFS, it was caused by histamine intolerance. And that's not allergies for all those out there. It's, it's a different thing. They don't break down the histamine with the DAO enzyme. For those folks, they need a very different diet. They need an antihistamine diet. And for that, there's two ways to go about it. You can either eat a lot of antihistamine foods while avoiding starches, so you're not feeding bacterial overgrowth. That's a long story. Uh, or you can actually go carnivore. Carnivore, ironically, even though it's full of high histamine things, works better than anything else I've seen to downregulate the histamines. Now, that's not going to work great in someone who has oxalate issues. So like I said, there's some sussing out that needs to be done uh, because it could be too much oxalate dumping. But the main one that I see regulate dysautonomia in long COVID is a ketogenic low lectin soup protocol based on the GAPS diet and modified more strictly. So that's the one that I healed with. That's the one that I use the most in my practice. And sometimes you have to tiptoe into that because you're going to have a radical shift in your microbiome when you go through that one. But it's basically avoiding all starch, crunchy foods, anything uh, that can disrupt the beautiful villi within the gut lining. And uh, and then for others that have the post-viral, we'll do the carnivore diet. So so there's lots of different approaches I'll take based on what, what they're presenting with. And I want to be clear because in the post-viral communities, especially, there's a lot of talk about histamines and histamines are getting a big upcoming swing, I guess you could say. But to be honest, with working with so many people with long COVID, I see histamine as a very secondary issue with most of them. And that's usually the case if someone has gotten sick with an infection and then gotten chronically ill, the histamines are not primary, like they would be in an MCAT patient who has the epigenetic form with all the anaphylaxis. And so it doesn't always have to be catered to. It will often self-regulate on its own as we're shifting the microbiome. I'm just soaking up every word of this. I'm going to have to watch this over and over again. It's just so helpful to hear all of this. I'm sure you have seen, have experienced something similar when it comes to diet. It feels like most of us are just, you know, out there just told to experiment and try and figure it out with really no sense. Like, oh, maybe I'll try this diet. Maybe I'll try that diet. And it's really hard to get a sense of where you should start or what could be a good fit for you. So it's so nice to hear that there are ways that we can evaluate and get a sense of it. You know, I work with over 41 different diets and my specialty is knowing which diet to use when and when to combine them. And I'm, I'm working on teaching that to others because that needs to be a known skill. And eventually when I get some time off, I'm going to write a choose your own adventure book for diets so that you know where to start and where to go from there. If you're doing well, if you're not doing well, where to back up to, because to be honest, all the diets have some merit. That's why they exist. And, uh, and it's an issue of when to use it and at what time. I became very interested with, I saw a talk by, is it Dr. Natasha Campbell talking about the GAPS diet? I hope I've got that right. And then I ended up reading her book and started implementing some of it. It was very intriguing to hear about the success that she was having with this. So for people who are familiar with the GAPS diet, uh, could you give a, a high level yes. uh, explanation of what it is? It is my favorite in my heart <laughs> because it, it put me into remission. But when you do the GAPS diet, there are a couple strict rules and it, it is a medical diet. So it can't be followed all week, but one day <laughs> it has to be done all the time. <laughs> and it has to be done for a minimum one to two years for it to work properly. Okay. Because of the microbiome. It was created by a neuroscientist, uh, MD, who is also, uh, also has a master's in nutrition. She studied in Russia where studying the microbiome was normal. They studied the microbiome long before we did in the States. So the knowledge and the depth of knowledge in her books are excellent, really excellent. And that's what got me going on it. Uh, when you do the GAPS diet, a hundred people on it could have very different things on their plates. So uh, if someone comes into me saying that they've already done the GAPS diet, I'm going to have a lot of questions to see if they did the right variety, because there's so many different ways you can do it. It does not discuss macros. It doesn't discuss amounts of carbs, fats, protein, none of that. What it is, is a very soft, warm diet, mostly of soups in the beginning, where you allow your gut lining to rebuild and you take out anything that could get in the way. Meanwhile, you are starving out bacterial overgrowth. Now, 
with the trillions of bacteria that we have, there are three main families of bacteria and they all eat different foods. Our, our pathogenic bacteria only eat starch and sugar. Our opportunistic bacteria only eat starch and sugar. And then our good bacteria, they're the easygoing ones. They'll eat fats, they'll eat protein, they don't care. So what we do on this diet is we pull up all forms of starch and sugar and anything that can turn into that, uh, with the exception of monosaccharides that don't feed the bacterial overgrowth. So for instance, some of my kids on the diet, this might sound contradictory if you haven't had the biochemistry of sugars, but they can have honey and fruits, but I would never use that with a chronic fatigue patient because of their lactic acid issues and their issues with making energy from glucose. So on the GAFS diet, it doesn't say if you're in ketosis, if you're low carb, if you're high carb, that's up to you and your condition and your practitioner. But what it pulls out are the starches for one to two years while you starve out the bacterial overgrowths. Now, those bacteria can live for three days, three weeks, a month, six months, 12 months, up to 24. So the more serious conditions, 24 months is safe. But at the end of that, then you can start to bring the starches back in. So it's not saying that starches are innately bad for us. We know they're not. They're part of many traditional diets, but it's a timing. And you can manipulate your diet very simply. It's not easy, but it's very simple. Uh, pulling out those foods, those bacteria, and let your microbiome reestablish. Now, why is that important? Our microbiome is everything. When you and I are looking at each other, we're not looking at humans. We're looking at constellations of bacteria. They are doing everything we think we do. They're eating our food. We don't eat our food. We eat their byproduct. They make our feel good chemicals. They do all sorts of stuff for us. So it's very important that we have a healthy balance. When we have a healthy balance, we are not so susceptible to infections and pandemics and all sorts of things. Amazing. Uh, I really am going to want to keep you here all day. You are such a wealth of information on this topic. It is just so helpful. And, and it's nice to hear it, this really resonates with my own experience as well of, you know, making changes, healing the body, and then you can reintroduce some things, which I think is nice for people to hear. Like this isn't a lifelong restrictive um, process they have to be a part of. It's, it, it's, a, it's a process of healing. Yes. It's like putting a cast on after you break a leg, right? So maybe before you broke a leg, you could go for a run every day. That would be eating whatever you want. Once you have an illness, you need a cast, <laughs> but that doesn't mean it's permanent. So my goal, my goal with myself and my goal with everyone I work with is to get them to where they can eat like everyone else. Uh, but in order to do that, we've really got to pull the arrow back and go on a very tight protocol so that they're healthy enough to do that. So they feel good when they eat other foods. They shouldn't be reacting to gluten or dairy. That's not normal. So it's a sign of, of uh, ill health, to be honest. So my goal is to make people very resilient. And if someone is out there doing it on their own, I would recommend that goal as well. We don't want to be on a diet forever. That said, it's very important mentally to not care. So, so like when I was, when I was going through all of this, I finally got to a place where I was so humbled, where I was like, you know what, if I only have to eat liver every day for the rest of my life, I will do it if it will get me better. So if you couple that mindset with also working towards getting robust so that you're not a snowflake, <laughs> you end up with a really good winning combination and you can expand and eat other foods later. And as I briefly mentioned earlier, you're doing some really exciting research right now on pre-colonial diets. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit about that? Yes. So I have been traveling the world. I just spent the last couple of years in Africa. Before that, I was in Europe. And right now I'm in South America. And I'm studying with regions of the world that haven't yet been touched by colonialism. So they're still on their traditional diets and they're still in perfect health a level of health that you and I cannot relate to. It is incredible. So I've been filming it and I'm writing a book on it, but my, my goal is to show people what health actually looks like and that it's possible and that we don't have to accept the level of illness that we're dealing with. I know, you know you're still in the process of doing the research, but are there any insights or um, patterns that you've seen so far that you yeah. 
that you can yeah, share? Yeah, the main pattern. And I don't know if I'll, I'll be able to convey this well enough to uh, to people listening to understand the depth of it. So if I fail you, I apologize. But the, the main pattern that I'm really seeing is that the folks, whatever tribe I'm visiting, they eat from within a mile or so. And they don't import. They don't trade. So if there's no salt in the region, then they drink blood from the animal to get the salt. If there are no plants, they only eat animal matter. If there is fruit, they'll do a mix. So, so they only eat from within a mile at all times. And so they're very seasonal. And I don't mean seasonal like shipping in blueberries from Michigan. <laughs> okay. So I mean, I mean actual seasonal in a way that we've lost touch with due to our importing and our processing methods with wax and vegetables and things like that. So if one were to do a mental exercise and imagine, okay, right now in this region, you in the Bay Area, if you had to go harvest food, what would you find? You would be eating a lot of seafood right now. You might eat some sea glass, that wonderful little succulent. That's very nice. That would still be going for another two weeks or so. What else would you have? It's a really great exercise to do. And when, when people live this way, they don't have a need even for natural medicines. It's been, it's been fascinating. I'll see lots of medicinal plants around the region when I'm hiking or going hunting with these groups. And I'll ask them if they use it. And they don't because they don't have a use. They're not sick. Do you think this is from, this is fascinating, by the way, I'm just thinking, you know, okay, yes, I'm in San Francisco, that makes sense, but I'm not from San Francisco, I'm from Canada, but my ancestors are actually from Europe. So how does this play into modern life for those of us that no longer live in a tribe? Yeah. Like how, what does that look like for us? I find it's best to eat where you are because that's okay. where you're going to get the right biodiversity. So I'm in Colombia right now. I'm eating Colombian food. When I was in Mexico last month, I was eating Mexican food. So it's really important to eat where you are, what season you are, not where you're from. Well, that is helpful. And that gives me hope because it feels a bit like, how are we possibly in this, you know, global village we live in? We're, we're, we're in trouble. How are we ever going to deal with this? Yes. Um, I think it sounds like it's doable, but it's going to change, require a massive mind shift. Yeah, it's doable. For, it requires for all education. And maybe not on the mass scale, but self-education, because most people don't know what plants are from where. Like when I'm, when I'm in Greece, the Greeks are just the best. And they really believe that the Greek salad is a traditional food. But the tomato has only been there for about 50 years. <laughs> so, so it's not a traditional food. And that's very common, you know. So, um, or like in Zambia, one of the villages that were we just donate a, a lot of animals to, they, they really believe that maize was a traditional food. It wasn't, of course, it came from the Americas, but it, it's part of their mythology now. So it's, hot, it's a bit of work to figure out what plants are actually from your region and what foods. And that, that actually applies to meats as well. Meats is, are also seasonal. Yeah, it sounds it sounds a bit intimidating, but you're right. I think just some, investing some time into education. When you asked me what I would eat in San Francisco, I was so glad you answered for me because I, I have no idea. The flowers that my building planted outside, I don't know. <laughs> yes, and there's a reason for that because if you live in a very sunny region like parts of India or LA, you can get away with eating a lot more plants. See, plants have deuterium in them. Deuterium, if you remember from your elemental table, it's a very heavy element. It's, its nickname is heavy water. And plants are full of this. Most plants, not all. Kale is low, but we won't get into semantics. Anyway, you can eat a plant-heavy diet if you're living in a sunny region because as we ingest the deuterium-rich plants, they weigh down our cells and can create illness. There are whole cancer clinics throughout the world just designed at lowering deuterium. So it's actually quite important to lower deuterium. Well, if you're in the sun and you allow the sun on your skin, you're not using, you know, sun lotion and hats and sunglasses. You allow the sun on your skin. It, it clears the deuterium from your cells. But if you're eating all those plants and you're in Iceland or Ohio and it's the winter, you're not clearing the deuterium. So that's why it's really important not to eat where you're from, but where you are. You can get away with a lot more if you're eating a regional diet. That is incredible. I'm, 
because I had with my own health recovery journey, I, I switched to uh, for a while, hundred percent plant-based diet. And it was a game changer for me. Like it just, my health started improving all over the place, but I was living in the tropics and I was a sun worshiper, even when in a time when we know better, you know, so I always had a tan and always outdoors and eating a ton of plants and yeah, I did really well. So that, yeah. I see a lot of people recover when they go to the tropics. If I could, I would pay for my clients to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know what, I'm not sure what it is. The weather, I'm just happier. It's just, yeah, it does seem to be um, a theme that I hear as well. So you have a lot of different programs and uh, different types of support that you provide to people. So could yes. you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So I've moved to running groups because especially with COVID, I've realized that uh, more people need help and I don't have anyone to refer out to. So I started running groups for certain conditions. I have a group for hormonal issues. That's everything from low testosterone, thyroid, endometriosis, PCOS, infertility, all of those. And then I have a group for my histamine intolerant folks because they do a very different diet. And in fact, I don't know your history well enough, but if you improved on that diet, you may have had some histamine issues going on. And then, uh, and then I have a group for my nervous system disorders, which is really my specialty. And that's the anything from neuropathy, MS, Parkinson's, long COVID, dysautonomia, POTS, all that kind of stuff. Then for my standing clients, I have groups by diets and they have all different conditions and they funnel into that. I run a practitioner program. And then I've hired a staff of nutritionists who have trained and can work with people. Outside of that, then I do as much education via the podcasts and articles as I can. I have a new article out. If it hasn't come out already for the Western A. Price Society, it should be out soon. And, uh, and that was on my work in Uganda with the Babwa and their traditional diet. And then I have several do-at-home uh, programs for people who don't really need guidance. You know, some of us can just read something and get the work done. So I have those as well. There's probably more. I mean, the Cows for Kids project. I, I was thinking yesterday, actually, I need to list off all the different things so that I have it organized because I have so many things going on. I'm releasing a diabetes program shortly. I have one for mental health disorders. I used to specialize in mental health disorders, uh, anxiety, depression. So the Back to Joy program is, is really like an at-home boot camp for that. So I, I have a lot. <laughs> I love that. And when I was looking at what you have on your website, which of course will be linked in the yes. video description for people watching, I highly encourage you to give it a click and check it out because there really is a good range, everything from, you know, sort of quick, quick start guides to, you know, more intensive long-term um, programs and whatnot. So yeah. I've really always liked people to choose uh, how long they want to work with me and if they want to do it on their own, because we're all different personality wise. I was, I'm the kind of person who, if I read it, I'll do it. And other people read really need hand holding. So I wanted to broach that and then also make it affordable for people because healing is already expensive. <laughs> it's already expensive to get sick. So you can do an at-home program that saves you a lot of money. Incredible. And then you also have a lot of social spaces where you share information yes. such as your podcast and Instagram. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. So on YouTube, you can find all the podcasts I do. I have started interviewing my own favorite scientists. I haven't released that yet, but I will shortly. I've got a whole compilation of those. And then on Instagram, you can follow my travels and see some of my tribal work. Wonderful. And again, all linked in the video description. Well, this has been incredible. Thank you so much, Mary. I just, uh, I'm so grateful for your time. It's such an honor to have you here. And thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for being a voice for people with chronic fatigue syndrome. It's really needed. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. And thanks as always to everyone who is watching. We can very much forward to your comments and your questions in the video description, and we can address those there as well. And for those of you watching, if you enjoyed this, I'll link a playlist up here. I have uh, expert interviews of doctors, scientists, researchers, all, all different sorts of people um, bringing their experience and their knowledge about health and recovery from conditions like ME-CFS and long COVID. So yeah, that's it for today. Thank you again, Mary. Thank you everyone who's watching. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next video.